Good morning to all of us who've joined in here for class. Also, good morning and welcome to all those who've joined in from the e-learning course. It's been an exciting couple of weeks uh, just to learn from each one of you here on the online sessions, as, as well as those who've been on, uh, who've tuned in with, uh, with the, at the e-learning portal. It's been very encouraging to see interactions, to see questions, thoughts, testimonies, and uh, I'm really excited, um, you know, as we learn these subjects together. Let's uh, quickly start with a word of prayer and we'll dive right in. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for a bright new day that you have given to us, Lord, as we enter into class and learn specifically about counseling and the way that you would like us to minister to people. I pray that you will open our hearts to understand, Lord, maybe unlearn things that uh, we've understood out of our experience and Lord, be, be in a place of un, helping to unburden, helping to um, love, accept, and also groom and bring people to maturity in you. Thank you for the number of people who you're going to bring um, to our ministry, to, to the way that we also interact. We pray, God, that we will be a blessing to each one because of what you are putting into us today. We give you all glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So thank you for all those who joined in uh, again. Um, we're going to... Um, we, we started off with uh, understanding about the Christian counselor last week. And uh, we kind of stopped uh, in between. We were looking at the principles uh, that a counselor needs to adopt while they are in a counseling relationship. We did the initial uh, four principles and we will quickly uh, look at the next three principles in our first uh, uh, class today. Um, so kindly give me a minute as I just uh, uh, put this, uh, as I share the slide. Okay. So the last week we uh, we had looked at certain attributes of the counselor. We had looked at that in the first part of it. The second part of it, we looked at the principles of counseling. And if you remember, and I hope you've gone back and <clears throat> done a bit of reading and checked out the notes, we did focus on the first four. We looked at individualization. We looked at purposeful expression of feelings. We focused on control, emotional involvement, and self-determination. Today we're going to look at the next three and uh, wrap up the first part of our uh, uh, of our uh, session uh, with this. So um, looking at the next one and uh, let me start off with bringing an example and as, as usual I'd like us to interact either through chat or uh, you know you could just unmute and speak or for those at the e-portal you know you could you could put it up at the discussion forum um, with your answers or with your understanding. So here's an, here is a, a husband talking to you and he says, he says, you know, I've got all this guilt. Every time I sleep with this other woman, I feel so guilty. What can I do about it? Uh, now, this, this specifically is not to, um, you know, figure out how we're going to counsel the person, but <clears throat> what would our... Uh, view be about a person who comes to us with um, with a, a situation like this. Maybe there's a question, questionable character. Maybe there is a questionable event. Maybe there are things that uh, that is completely outside the alignment of what God wants for the life of an individual. And and in a case like this, you're able to see that this person is far away from where God would want him to be. Okay, so this is not about how you're going to counsel them, but how do you view a person like this who comes to you with uh, issues or with, with conditions or with circumstances that seem questionable? Um, what would, would anybody like to, uh, a quick um, observation or thought as to how would you approach somebody who comes in and actually uh, 
uh, you know, tells you something very shocking on your face. Yes, Charles, please go ahead. Uh, I am, uh, there are two areas that I am first considering. If this person that is telling me that they feel guilty, are they Christians or they are just people who are not Christians, but the, the, the guilty is coming to them? Mm -hmm. And then my first step would be to establish the angle at which I'm going to look at it. If they are Christians, then I handle it from the Christian angle. If mm -hmm. they are not Christians, then I, I handle it from a non-Christian angle. Uh, mm -hmm. Like <clears throat> uh, infidelity, if they are not non-Christian, like they are, they are becoming not um, not uh, faithful to their partners. Uh, mm -hmm. Two, there is um, greed. There is greed because uh, all women are the same. It's like all women are like tea. There is this lady, this man who was working with a certain lady in in a in a in, in a company, and this man was always demanding that they sleep together. The woman kept on dodging until the woman decided to teach a lesson to the man and said, "My husband has gone for a business trip tonight. Let's go." So they went, when they reached there, the lady prepared a very big flask of tea, and the first cup he, she brought was a plastic cup and put their tea and gave the man, and the man drank it. Then they talked and talked, and then after some few minutes, she took off the plastic cup and brought the clay cup and gave him more tea. Then after that, she brought... um. A, a, a metallic cup and she gave him tea. After the third, she asked the man, how is my tea, baby? The man said, oh, the tea is good. It has been coming from the same cup, rather from the same flask. So it's the same. Then she said, even all women are like tea. Only that we are put in different cups but we are like tea, we use the same sugar. So I would give him such uh, an illustration and show him the, the level at which greed is taking them. Then uh, as a Christian, I would also read a couple of verses to support uh, the idea of uh, being unfair and unfaithful with your partner. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you for your thoughts on that. Um, and, and I know that there are some of you who've also written about what uh, um, you would do. Someone says, uh, you know, listen attentively and pray over it. Um, another person says that they remember what they studied last year about amputation. Now, uh, if, you, if you heard carefully my question, my question was, how would you approach them, not the situation now the situation i think we do understand that if it is christian yes we back it with the word of god if it isn't then we help them to really explore uh, what they're going through my question was how do you approach a person like this and i think that's where the principle comes about is what we're looking at is the principle of acceptance so no matter what the counseling comes with whatever issue or um, a circumstance that the person comes with, there is a recognition of the person. There is a recognition that the person has value, the person has dignity, he has worth, he has rights, he has needs, regardless of what, where they may be coming from, wherever in the culture they may be coming from, the environment they are from, the generation they're from, the behavior, or whatever it is, we accept the person for who they are. So I just want to uh, trace it back to some of the ways, you know, in, in the ministry of Jesus, how he dealt with those who were sinners. He loved them for who 
they they were there wasn't a judgment on their character or on or or on their personhood sorry on their personhood and that's what we need to look at that so when you accept when you accept a person with all of their erroneous behaviors or characters it doesn't mean that you approve of their behaviors or their standards or their attitudes it doesn't it doesn't mean that if you accept them as people that means you accept what they did that is a very very stark difference between the two accepting them as people and accepting their behavior so what the acceptance specifically includes is the way that you think and you feel towards them as people and it is definitely expressed in in the way that you serve them right when you think about someone um who you are extremely angry with because they did something to you okay maybe it isn't true of you right now but maybe earlier on <clears throat> when someone has done something absolutely unpardonable to you and uh, to be able to be link the two to accept them for their for who they are as people and to accept their behavior so when we the principle of acceptance shows and helps us to communicate this this one thing that uh, irrespective of whatever qualities or conduct it is an expression of goodwill that you have towards your counselee and any kind of evaluation if that is done it is out of goodwill so it is so what you're doing is you're conveying your concern as well as your understanding of the counselee uh, despite the problem so there may be a behavior which he is hated for or punished by the society and this relationship that he is coming to a counseling relationship can only be effective if there is acceptance of the person so a counselor accepts the individual as a person of dignity and worth and not treat them as a problem um Uh, and accept the counselee's uh, but being in a place of accepting the feelings or the positive or the negative feelings that the counselee may be going through he accepts the counselor accepts the counselee as they are with their limitations and believes that the acceptance begins as the crux of all help so the counselor does not condemn or feel hostile towards the counselee because his or her behavior is different from that which may be approved of or that which we know is right okay so it is a place where an individual is seen with that dignity with that worth acceptance of them as a person does not mean approval of their behavior or their attitudes or their standards okay so that's the fifth principle the principle of acceptance moving on to the sixth one and i'm here i want to bring another example okay we're going into the sixth principle so the example here is a wife in counseling says i just separated from my husband i'm in emotionally involved with another man i'm not sure that my husband and i can work it out i know what my beliefs are but i'm not sure what to do okay so in a in a scenario like this uh, again what what is um this is an ex, maybe it it uh, you know it it appears again that this person is definitely someone who um who's not in a right place okay being separated from their husband emotionally involved with another man again yes acceptance comes in here but this is this is also to bring about the next principle of the principle of a non judgmental attitude okay and this principle is based on the uh, sorry based on the premise of what we read in Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 to Uh, one and two and i'd just like to read that for you 
so that it uh, helps helps all of us. So Matthew 7, 1 and 2 reads, Stop judging others and you will not be judged, for others will treat you as you treat them. Whatever measure you use in judging others, it will be used to measure how you are judged. Okay, so the non-judgmental attitude is a quality of the um, counseling relationship. So the counselor has to be careful to not blame the counselee for the problem. Like we understood in the principle of acceptance, they only help to evaluate the attitudes or the standards or the actions of the counselee, but not standing in judgment. Okay, so when you stand in judgment, it is, it's again, it's based on this underlying uh, premise that the helping process precludes assigning guilt or innocence. You're not there to make them feel guilty or make them think they're innocent. What you're helping them to do is to come to a place of evaluating their attitudes, their standards, for believers in the line of what God's word says, and maybe for those who are unbelievers or who don't know the truth of God, to be able to help them explore things that that give that that move them to a place of life or move them to a place of death. So I'd still use the principles of scripture even when I deal with someone who's a non-believer. Maybe I will not bring uh, open the word of God and say, you know, this is what the word of God says. It says, um, <clears throat> do not commit adultery. But then I help the individual to make those evaluate judgments about their own attitudes or about their own actions and help them to come to a place of understanding. So this principle is based on that uh, premise that we help them to make those evaluated judgments for themselves by helping them reflect on their own attitudes or on their own standards or their own actions or behaviors that, that may come about, okay? Moving on to the last uh, um, uh, principle uh, is, this is an example and I will hit straight into my principle. Um, it's a teenager who comes in to see you, sits down and says, I hate my parents, they stink and I don't care what happens to them. Okay, so let's say it's it's your counseling room and the parents are standing out right outside and this is what the teenager comes in and says to you. Would you go to the parents and say, hey, dad and mom, this is what uh, your kid thinks about you. Your kid thinks that you you stink and that they, they hate you. Okay, um, what would you, what would you do? What, what should you be doing rather? Class, are you here with me? There's a lot of yes, silence. Yes, we are. Oh, you are. Okay, okay. Yes, we are here. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> okay, all right, great. Okay, thank you, thank you. All of y'all are here, lovely. Okay, so, uh, I, I, okay, I'll go straight in. This brings us to the principle called is the principle of confidentiality, okay? Now, this is, what does principle of confidentiality mean is to protect the private information that is disclosed to you in a professional relationship or even in a pastoral relationship. When someone is coming and sharing their, their secrets or their difficulty or their challenges to you, you're in a place of keeping it protected. And it is something that we see is, is a right of a counselee. And, and that's why they come hoping and praying that you know you will not use it as a sermon pointer or as an example on the pulpit or you know or in, in any other kind of a forum and a lot of people who come that's the first thing they ask will you ensure that what i say to you remains confidential because a lot of times they fear going to other people is because that in, information is taken and misappropriated okay and it is um, so as a professional, so, you know, for those of, uh, for me who's done a professional study, it is an ethical obligation. If I 
fail that, if I violate that, that means I have been non-ethical in the way that I have responded to my counselor. So it is an obligation towards my counselor, to counseling, sorry. And it is necessary for effective helping because it is only in a safe, safe space of trust that a counselee can, can open up all that they are going through. It is the counselee's right. However, this right is always not absolute. So what do I mean by this? In some cases, con confidentiality is, can be breached. And I will explain to you uh, on what kind of conditions. So the first one is this information that the counselee's information is shared with other professional people or persons for the help that they can get. So, and that's something that is mentioned that, you know, the case details, maybe not <clears throat> not demographic details, that is their name, their age, their place, or where they come from, what they're doing, but case details sometimes need to be discussed with other people or other professional help so that help can be given adequately and holistically. And this is something we also do in even in, in the organization, in Chrysalis, that, that there may be times that the counselor feels, um, you know, different periods where they're either stuck or there is there's something else that they're not able to understand. We work together as a team, discuss certain cases and look at effective ways of dealing with that. Another time when it is breached is when there is a threat of harm, <clears throat> a threat of life of harm to themselves or to somebody else. For example, there is someone who comes to you is extremely suicidal and is telling you a plan that they are going to kill themselves. This is a place that, um, you know, so, so right at the beginning, we do mention it to them that everything would be confidential, except if there is an assessment, if there's a risk of harm towards themselves or towards others. So if there is a risk of harm towards themselves, or you notice that, you know, the counselee may be uh, probably stalking somebody or ready to harm or kill someone because, uh, of, because of, of whatever issues they may be going through. In such cases is where confidentiality is breached. There again, it is always done given uh, by giving information to the counselee that one or two people will be reached out to ensure the safety of life of the counselee or anyone else who may be uh, who may, uh, you know, who may be at risk. So that's something that is discussed right in the beginning of the session on what what are some of the uh, uh, breaches that can uh, that can work into counselling. So that it is one is it is an obligation of whatever information that's shared. But if there is, let's say, someone who is suicidal or there is a harm to a risk of harm to someone else, there may be either a family member or an employer or uh, someone in authority who needs to know just that detail, you know, just the detail of, you know, this person is at risk to himself or is at risk to this person. We need to ensure that there is a watch or there is some kind of an additional help that's given. So it's only that part of the information <clears throat> that is shared with <clears throat> with other people who, who you know, the counselor may, may need to enlist the support and the help from. Okay, so the, these are so these were the last three uh, skills that we spoke about. I'll just quickly put up that list once again. Oh, oh, sorry. And there is one more point where usually a written information, a written permission, is required if there needs to divulge any information to those to anyone else involved. So you take a written permission saying that this, you know, uh, th this information may be the information that you are at risk to someone or, you know, that there is a, there is this, suppose the, the, the counselee himself comes to you and says, I want you to divulge this information to my employer that maybe I'm mentally ill. So we take that permission from them, a written 
uh, permission saying that I permit my counselor to divulge this information to them and you know have it signed because it it is often maybe not here in in our country in india as much but then in other countries um, counselors can be sued if um, uh, confidentiality isn't maintained to the uh, to the uh, specific situation that is that is uh, that is required to be divulged okay so so going quickly the just um, Moving on those principles, we spoke about individualization, purposeful expression of feelings, controlled emotional involvement, self-determination, acceptance, non-judgmental attitude, and confidentiality. Is there any, any question on this? Um, if not, you know, we could move on ahead to the next uh, topic. Any questions with this? What I, would, what I would recommend all of you to do is in your conversation with people, uh, you know, even as you're conversing to family or to maybe a church member or to a friend, um, try and keep these principles in mind and uh, see how you can use them in your conversation. Remember, these are not these are more attitudes that we need to have rather than, you know, doing, you can't do acceptance or you can't do non-judgmental, right? It's, it's an attitude that we need to create. So I'm, I'm uh, challenging all of you in your conversation with people, use these seven principles in the way that you engage with people. And as you use them, you will find that you, you actually get better, better at them. Okay. Yes, I think there are two questions, Charles and uh, Kennedy. Yes, Charles, we can start with you. <clears throat> no, I didn't. I don't have a question. I oh, okay. maybe accidentally I raised up with the hand. All right. Okay. No problem. Kennedy, I think Kennedy, you have a question. Yeah, yeah I have a question. Yes, Kennedy. My, go question, ahead. my question is that in the, all this process, I have not. Uh, it's not come clear to me. How do you probe? How do you make the counselee to open up to give you accurate information? Because at times, you see, they might give you something that is just cosmetic. It's not the real issue, not the real problem. How do you open? How do you make them open in your probing so that you make sure you get the basic information that is required to help them? Thank you. Okay. Kennedy, that, that involves skills, which we are just going to come to. We are just what do you say we're just we're just making things comfortable for us so that we can learn the skills all of what how are they going to open up how are they going to talk all of that comes in the skills which we are yet to get into right so the principles are just okay, the okay, foundation of how we build our attitude we will be coming on to those those pointers in a couple of classes all right okay okay thank you thank you, thank you. yeah samuel you had a question Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, uh, Pastor, I was wondering um, where where does um, a counselor determine um, the end, the exit of a particular case uh, mm -hmm. or particular counseling? Like, for example, like in most of the scenarios, like, let's say, you know, uh, a, 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 a person on a terminal illness asking you, will I die? Or a husband coming to you um, and saying, um, I'm guilty of doing this, having an affair. Or a teenager coming and saying, I hate my parents. So we start with the process, the probing and all. Um, and, um, and I'm thinking, and broadly I'm thinking there's two ways. One is we, we help the counseling uh, come to the right path and the affair is ended, uh, the terminal patient gets to know that he or she's dying and starts settling his or her own affairs. Uh, the, the person, the teenager starts reconciliation with the parent. So that's, that's all you know, positive. Uh, and probably uh, there's a timeline and, and, you know, and some may even take longer, but let's say when, when things are like the, when, when things don't seem to be going in that positive direction, when, uh, you know, like you've tried everything, you've followed all the principles, you've tried everything, but the husband doesn't seem to be wanting to end the affair, uh, the, the teenager doesn't want reconciliation. When, when does the counselor determine, okay, I'm done with this uh, case and I need to probably move on, I've done everything, I've used all the tools in my bag, 
um, so so do 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 you do you have a principle that determines uh, uh, i'm i'm going to go to this certain extent and this is when i call it quits so so that's that's a good question and i think there are very many different levels in understanding that but i will try and uh, as best as possible try to organize my thoughts on it so the first and foremost thing when a person when a counselee comes to you the reason that they are there is because they need some help and the help can be very different for one they may have all their thoughts organized and they just need to articulate and talk and express what they're going through and maybe within the first session they've got a good idea as to how they need to work out or uh, deal with their situation okay they may i mean like like this this young woman would come back and say you know i figured this out i know that this is not the way that i'm going so they themselves have come to a place of actually determining that that this is the end right so some some can happen in one session some can come to you where they're absolutely clueless about the way forward or what even is this the the very um, uh, uh, fiber of their problem so what you're doing there is helping to uh, bring about so certain goals what are we looking at you you as a counselee and me as a counselor working together to achieve to have as an outcome so when you help them to look at an outcome you're actually getting that, like for example this this man he says i don't want to feel guilty anymore about sleeping with this person i need to change the way that i uh, that that you know it, it's haunting me uh, and i need help right so he knows that he needs help he doesn't know what kind of help so he's kind of defined the fact that i want to be rid of my guilt and i want some kind of help so there is where you begin to formulate certain goals along alongside with your counsel counselee and and there may be and that's what generally in my session the first thing that i do is i want to know what are you hoping to achieve by the end of our sessions so in that way i get a good frame to understand where they are looking at at changing okay now i may add on certain things like especially when they're believers i may i may say okay this is probably an area that you have uh, dealt with but but do you think there is also let's say maturity in the way that you deal or cope with your emotions is that something that you would like to work on so maybe that's not something that they've seen but something that i've probably picked up and i bring that out to them but of course they have the freedom to use the principle of self determination to decide whether they would want to go there or they are satisfied with what it is and we 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 allow that all right now in there are there are some sometimes when they don't they're not looking for an outcome but they're just looking at a place of exploring what they're going through so i'd say the counselee is generally the one who deals uh, who who leads this who leads the the place of of working through it and in in certain uh, sessions you will begin to see that Uh, and I, and i think a, a lot more will be understood as we go on to the next chapter when we look at a person's functioning or or what a person is made up of we look at them at five different areas and i and i'll come to that and if you see that they are able to function and cope well in these five areas that's when you would say you know i think this person is doing much better and that's where you kind of bring about a termination so not all cases you would terminate like this but it all really depends on there isn't um, you know there, there aren't watertight compartments on how you deal with a specific counselee they're all in they all are made up so differently with their issues and their needs that you really look at finding out whether these needs in, especially in these five areas uh, which we're going to talk about if that's met then then you make the call and say i think this is this is as much as help that i can offer or you've come to a point of place that that you seem to be much better off and that's how you would terminate okay uh um, thank you boss just one small okay. follow up yeah um uh, so i mean a part of what i understand is also a lot of it depends on how far the counselee uh continues to seek your help and and you know continues to engage in this uh in this relationship format um but as a counselor say you know you you see that 
you know, you're far from the goal. Uh, and uh, the counselee, for whatever reason, is dropping out or decides to drop out. How actively do you do you pursue? Proactively, do you do you seek this person out? So, and 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 I think that happens many times. A lot of people hope that in their first session, you know, things will all be sorted out. You have a magic pill. You say the right words. You do the right thing, and everything will be sorted out. So I blow the bubble right in the beginning and say, don't think that's going to happen. This is a journey. This is a process. However, there are many times people don't come after the first session, but I do. Um, I do as a principle. I follow up once after every week after every month and then three months and if even after that if i don't find that they may be interested then i just leave that so out of my my own discipline i generally do this if they have not followed up i do this thrice over and but then i've seen very many times because of just the act of actually following up with them many months later or maybe years later they come back and you know they they renew that contact once again and i think that's you know they're ready at that point of time until then um, you just have to let go and let god thank you thank you Pastor. yeah all right yes kennedy i think you have another question kennedy or christopher anybody <clears throat> No. Okay. Hello? No, it's not you, Candy. Okay. Christopher, would you like to bring out your question? Uh, yes, Pastor, uh, thank you. Um, my question is, um, you know, in a, in a situation where um, someone perhaps uh, you, you may know or, uh, you know, someone uh, who, is, uh, who comes and wants to um, get some, some level of... Uh, you know, forgiveness from from God uh, for a crime that's already taken place, and uh, they you know they come to a counselor and um, uh, use that counselor to you know to kind of mediate with God. Um, but a crime has already taken place. So, for example, yeah, for example, a robbery or you know maybe something worse. And uh, um, because of the confidentiality aspect of it. Um, you know um, what? What would a counselor do uh, in a typical sort of scenario? In a you know in a in a legal kind of uh, uh, arena, you know, there's the, the uh, attorney-client um, privilege that um, usually should safeguard this this con confidentiality. So, just wanted to understand um, if this has happened, you know, in your uh, in your experience, and what would one one do in that? Uh, in that sort of situation. Okay, so I think what you're saying is in case someone uh, um, uh, is found in a crime but yet comes to you for uh, help, for forgiveness, but what would you do? Would you, would you need to report such a, such a crime? Is that, is that what you're... That's right, what you're that's heading right. To? Okay. Yes. All right, okay. So, um, uh, one of the things that uh, we need to um, understand also is we are we are also answerable to to the law or or a legal law or your country or your um, or the law of the land. All right. So there may be certain instances or certain events that definitely may require that um, the person does. Uh, does uh, what's the one? I'm not able to get the word. Um, owns up, owns up their fault or owns up their 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 issue, and uh, so you may not do it on behalf of the council uh, of the counselee, but again, you would probably enlist the 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 uh, help of somebody else, especially looking at the gravity of the situation. Like for example. Let's say it's an abuse, it's a sexual abuse, and you have the perpetrator right in front of you. So you are um, uh, obligated by legal law to report such cases for many reasons. For one, 
that uh, you know if letting this the perpetrator out on the loose can can definitely bring harm to those around so doing it wisely and doing it in a way that um, helps the situation I, the first foremost i mean i think the principle that we attempt to follow is yes let's say if there is a legal for example this is also something that we do put up in our confidentiality in our consent form that says if there is um, there are questions or there is uh, any kind of a warrant that comes to given details about certain sessions because you know it has a, a legal aspect to it we are obliged by law to do that um, right and that's something that is also explained to the counselee before we do so so we try we do we try and do the best that we can to do it as sensitively as possible but there may be certain things that is as part of the law of the land that we are obligated to do and uh, um, and that's that's something that we need otherwise what happens is it can land your organization or your counselor into trouble because you've stood in uh, as a as a as, as a secondary witness to that to that crime right so it looks at the law of the land and i think that's how you would respond but doing it as sensitively as possible in a way that uh, um, you know that that doesn't break uh, that that relationship like for example uh, i remember i mean i've not had a personal experience of it but then i remember in the hospital that i worked there was someone uh, who had come into the psychiatrist there and uh, we encouraged the person to get an get a lawyer get an attorney and to move the case legally so that's what we would probably do in the best way to help uh, process this uh, um, as sensitively as possible yeah, Christopher, i hope i answered your yes, question yes thank you okay all right um okay so we we will um move into the uh, next yes uh, kennedy okay. go ahead go ahead just, just regarding what brother samuel had asked eh? there's the issue of termination of the text that's the way it is the, the issue how you can terminate your the way you're handling your custody now there's an issue where somebody's coming and you have to give palliative care can you can you give some light on that uh sorry kennedy i'm sorry i didn't follow what you said uh in relation what yeah. brother, brother Samuel had asked about termination of your, maybe your targeted. In so relation in, in to case, what the family yeah. asked for the termination of the case, is that what you said? Brother Samuel, Samuel. Samuel. In relation to what I had asked, uh, I think sorry. he has a follow up question for my question. Oh, okay. In uh, yeah. Oh, oh. In what Samuel asked? Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, so sorry, sorry. yeah. Once again, oh, what okay. is the question? In relation to what Samuel had asked for his first question, somebody is coming and see for somebody is ill while you are giving palliative care. How do you approach that kind of termination? Okay, Kennedy. May I please request you to put the question on chat? I'm not able to pick up. Uh, uh, what you okay, ask me. I'll do it. I'll really, do it really sorry. Please, please, kindly I'll just put it, it up on chat. Yeah, I'm waiting. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so I think till we wait for uh, Kennedy to come back in. What I'd like to. Um, uh, uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, you know, we can take an early break um, because the next part of the lesson is a, is a little bit long and I don't, don't want to cut it off uh, um, and I'd like to just, you know, take it in, in one flow. So would, would you all mind if we take a break earlier? Um, it's 10.45 on my clock and we can come back at 10.55 and we can go ahead um, starting off with the, the new uh, the, the next chapter. So uh, I hope that's okay with you all. And uh, Kennedy, please put down your question. In the next uh, hour, we will we will deal with that. So I'll meet you all. We'll meet back at uh, ten fifty-five.